So our seminar series is sponsored by our office, the Office of Data Science Strategy. Our goal is to catalyze data science activities across all of NIH's institutes and centers and create a modernized and integrated, fair and equitable biomedical data ecosystem. And you can see some of the activities that we work on um, by looking at our graphic wheel. Next slide. One of the important activities that we're launching this year is uh, an understanding of search capabilities across the biomedical landscape um, for NIH-wide data discovery. I wanna point out that we do have this RFI open until December 3rd, and I hope that we will be able to get responses from the broader biomedical research community. You can submit your responses to the uh, link there. You can also look at the notice uh, OD-21-187. And um, again, I thank you for your responses. This will help inform us uh, as we move forward uh, in our search capabilities. The next slide is just a reminder that our questions are proposed through Slido. You can see the link here at the bottom. Um, and so this is a way that you can see what people are interested in talking about with our speaker, uh, as well as post questions. The next slide. I'm going to be pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Alexander Ropoliski from the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. He'll talk about the Brain Imaging Library, a resource for sharing microscopic data. Our host is the National Institute of Mental Health each uh, month. A different institute at NIH sponsors and supports a speaker that talks about the ways in which their institute and their PIs are sharing data uh, and reusing data. Next slide. Please join us on December 10th at 12 p.m. Our speaker will be Dr. Casey Green. The host is the National Human Genome Research Institute, and we'll talk about open data and how this can be powered by AI-based approaches to tackle biomedical challenges. So you can learn more about all of our seminars, as well as see recordings of past seminars by looking at the link below. Next slide. So it's really a pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues from the National Institute of Mental Health. First, our host and lead IC is, uh, the, is Dr. Greg Barber, who is unfortunately unable to join us today due to other commitments. Greg is the director of the Office of Technology Development and Coordination at NIMH. This office oversees and coordinates all of NIMH's efforts related to research and development of technologies and in scientific informatics to ensure coherent strategic approaches to research. And this could include advanced technology development, small business um, awards for innovative technologies and direct uh, data resources, including importantly, the NIH national data on autism research. Our host uh, today uh, will be Dr. Rebecca Rosen, who was previously the deputy uh, for this institute, uh, this center, but now she has moved on to the uh, National uh, Institute for Child Health and Development, NICHD. She is the Senior Advisor to the Office of Technology Develop Development and Coordination, uh, and now is the, the, the Director of the uh, Office of Data Science Strategy and Sharing in NICHD. So with that, I am going to pass it on to Rebecca. Thank you so much for coming today, Rebecca, and introducing our uh, speaker. Absolutely. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Robaleski. Um, so Alex, he's the Director of Biomedical Applications at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. It's a, an NSF-funded resource I think many of you are familiar with. It's led by Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Alex is also the Operations Director and Principal Investigator for the Brain Image Library. Before I get into the Brain Image Library, I wanted to, to tell you a little more about Alex. Um, I, I'm really impressed with your background, Alex. You've spent over 25 years uh, training scientists how to use computational tools. Well before that was in vogue, you've been doing that um, in your role at, at the uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, um, training both faculty and students. And, uh, and, uh, and you have a, a really strong ex uh, background in improving diversity in the biomedical workforce in the uh, bioinformatics and computation space. He's part of the uh, NIH-funded MARC program since its founding uh, and, and at PSC. And it serves multiple uh, multi um, uh, minority serving institutions. And so Alex actually travels around the country 
um, with hands-on, uh, or used to travel around the country, uh, supporting hands-on training of faculty and students at minor minority-serving institutions, um, and a lot of work in the analysis of next-generation sequencing data, which is not what you'll be talking about today. But I really want to emphasize uh, um, you are an exemplar in uh, training, and so it's data use and reuse, but also uh, building capacity in, an, in a diverse way and really bringing up uh, the, the workforce like we need uh, for data science here at NIH and, and everywhere in the biomedical space. And so you're the PI of the Brain Image Library. This is one of seven brain initiative data archives. So there was a funding opportunity announcement that went out in 2017. And that's when uh, the, the BIL was first funded along with six other uh, archives as part of the Brain Initiative Data Archive Strategy. So there's an archive each for multi-omics data, invasive human neurophysiology data, MRI neuroimaging data, electron microscopy, X-ray microtomography data, cellular neurophysiology data, and then NEMAR for electro uh, EEG, I'm gonna save myself the stumbling, EEG and MEG data. And so I'm, I'm, Alex, I know you're going to give an introduction to uh, brain image library as uh, the confocal fluorescence microscopy archive uh, as, uh, for the brain initiative, uh, the trans NIH initiative. And so we're really happy to have you here. Uh, like I said, you are an exemplar in, in uh, training, uh, diversity, and reuse and use of data. And so thank you so much for coming and, and telling us more about your work on the brain image uh, library. Thank you. I will get started. Let me see here. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep. All right, that's good. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Brain Image Library, which as, as was mentioned, I'm the, the lead PI on, on that project, but really with, with most of data science today, uh, particularly data science that, that is large and requires uh, high performance computing resources. What it really is, is it, it's a team. And the Brain Image Library team is, is made up of a number of folks at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center who have various computational uh, experience. Um, plus we do have um, other, uh, we're really a partnership as well with, with two large uh, imaging centers, um, the, the CBI at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, led by Dr. Simon Watkins, and the Molecular Biosensor and Imaging Center at Carnegie Mellon, led by Marcel Ruche. And I've got to say that we, we work together very well. And um, like most of team science, you know, doing, doing good work requires a good team. And I think we have a great team. So what I'm going to discuss today is a little bit about the Brain Image Library and what our data scope is. I'm going to talk about some of the resources that we provide to promote the sharing of microscopy data. Going to move on to talk about an exciting project that some of you may have seen in uh, published in Nature. Um, and that is some of the work done through the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. Uh, particularly their, the primary motor cortex project. So I'll talk a little bit about that, specifically about some of the microscopy work um, that, that was done as part of that, that project, and also some of the lessons learned talking to the various uh, investigators in BICCN. I'm then going to transition and talk about a real exciting project that we're also involved in, led by uh, Elizabeth Hillman from Columbia University, and that is the, the Hollis uh, Project. And the Hollis Project is, is really exciting because it's going to produce petabyte human brain data sets, and we're, we're really excited to be part of that, uh, that project. Um, that said, as data sizes increase, um, for example, right now, large mice data sets um, are around 10 terabytes. 
Um, and there's, it's quite a jump from a 10 terabyte data set to, to a petabyte data set. So I do want to talk about some of the challenges in sharing petabyte data sets and where um, we think things will be addressed and, and where we could use some good ideas uh, from the community to help address some of those challenges. So as mentioned earlier, uh, Bill is part of the data archives established by the, the Brain Initiative. And the approach taken by the Brain Initiative informatics program is that each archive focuses on a single data modality. And I've listed a number of these archives um, up here on the screen. So if you need to uh, contribute data, uh, you, you can find the, the correct archive to do so. Um, if you have data that's not mentioned, uh, by all means, uh, get in touch with me and I will try and find you the right place to house your your data. An important thing to note, um, and this, this just became active, is there's a number of different data sharing um, initiatives that are out there. And one from the Brain Initiative essentially requires investigators to share the data that they collect with the Brain Initiative archive. So if you are an investigator and you're not aware of, of that requirement, I'd like to refer you to the NIH notice. So that said, so what is the bill? The bill and our mission is to be the national public resource for high quality microscopy data, enabling researchers to deposit, analyze, mine, share, and interact with those data. Bill relies on contributions from data producers. And while Bill is NIH funded, NIH funding is not required to contribute data. The real restriction on contributing data is that the data contributed really needs to be of interest to the BRAIN initiative. And since many data sets that, uh, that we receive are quite large, um, we also provide extensive computational access to our data through a unique high performance uh, computing facility. I uh, should also mention that there's no charge for depositing data into Bill or using any of our services, including our user access and support. So to dig a little bit deeper into our data scope, our data scope includes whole brain data sets from mice, uh, primates, including humans and model organisms. Uh, this includes targeted microscope enabled experiments, including connectivity between cells and spatial transcriptomics. And we've also taken as part of our mission to um, be willing to house any historical collections that are out there in the community. It was brought to our attention um, at one of the SFN meetings that uh, there were some collections that were out there um, that investigators have, have maintained their entire career curating that are of value to the community. Um, and we will uh, basically, if that per individual needs someone to, to take over and house that, that uh, historical collection, um, would be happy to, to talk to them and try to make that happen. In terms of existing coverage in Bill, the overwhelming amount of data sets contributed are from mice. Uh, with a handful of, of data sets from marmosets and humans. In terms of data, we're doubling the data sets that we receive about every year and currently have about five petabytes of data on disk and nearly 10 million public files. In terms of data modalities, most of our data sets are slicewise image stacks from whole brain imaging experiments. And in addition to to these, this type of data, we also have thousands of, of tracings from primary data sets that are held in the archive. There we go, whoop, went a little bit too far there, sorry about that. So 
So what I'm showing you is a preview of some of the high quality data in Bill. Uh, this video shows a cell counting um, data set contributed by Dr. Pavel Austin uh, from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And this two channel whole brain data set, um, it's only a few hundred slices, um, but it's a nice size to make a, a nice short video to, to show people. Some of the largest, uh, highest resolution mouse data sets that we have in Bill are generated using a technology called FMOST. And these FMOST data sets range somewhere between eight and 13 terabytes each and contain about 10,000 to 15,000 uh, slices per data set. The resolution of each individual slice um, in terms of pixels is about uh, 35,000 pixels by about uh, 55,000 pixels. And the FMOST data sets, um, I believe their spacing is about one micron. Specific data in Bill may be searched for using faceted metadata searching, which show the location of the data, a download link to the data, and the location that you will find the data on our computing platforms. The majority of data currently in Bill um, results from work done by uh, the Brain Initiative uh, Cell Census Network investigators. And that is the main, one of the, the main results from the Brain Initiative uh, Cell Census Network um, is a series of joint analysis uh, projects. And I will be talking about that joint analysis project in a few slides. So the data in Bill is fair, but we're always trying to make data more fair because fair is actually a spectrum rather than a, a, single, um, a, a single binary qu uh, quantity. And some of the things that we're working on right now is we are transitioning to, first of all, a new metadata schema that was developed through Brain Initiative funding. Um, this was a project led by uh, Dr. Carol Hamilton uh, as part of her Collaborative Standards for Brain 3D Microscopy project. The nice thing about this new metadata schema is it is aligned very well with uh, required DOI metadata. So it's makes it, it will make it a lot easier for us to issue DOIs, which we are also transitioning to. Uh, we do have a, a membership in data site and we currently are issuing DOIs, but they're issued on a per request basis. So if somebody has a paper that they're going to publish and they want a, a DOI, uh, they can contact us and we will issue a DOI for that, that data set. Um, we do have plans to issue DOIs automatically with the implementation of the new uh, metadata standard that uh, I described earlier. Um, one of the differences between the current metadata and the, the new metadata standard is, is in addition, um, you know, to, to that's just kind of holding us back with issuing DOIs on the current data sets is that there's, there's certain fields that we need to go back to the researchers, the contributors and, uh, and collect to be able to issue the DOI. In terms of resources, uh, Bill provides a number of resources uh, to enable both uh, pre-submission exploration of data, as well as exploration of data in Bill by the community. Um, these resources are available at no charge for open research and uh, to support coursework as well. In terms of computation, we provide uh, through Bill a dedicated large memory system that uh, investigators can use to, to process data. All of our data is also available on the PSC's largest high performance computing system uh, called Bridges2, which has uh, essentially 10,000 cores and nodes of different memory types. Uh, we have uh, GPU nodes, um, large memory nodes, uh, what we call large memory nodes, which are four terabyte nodes and um, smaller uh, regular memory nodes with between uh, 256 and a terabyte of, of RAM each. 
We also, our data is also available on a unique hardware platform that PSC recently installed, a platform that, that we call NeoCortex, which is a Cerebrus a CS1 system. Um, it's essentially a system that is using the largest integrated circuit that has been made to date. Uh, so it's really designed for AI applications. So it would be interesting uh, to explore some of the build data. Um, and if you have an AI approach that you, you might be interested in trying on NeoCortex to explore build data, I'd, I'd love to, to hear from you and we can make that happen. We also provide a virtual machine system, um, in, including remote uh, interactive desktop software. The virtual machine system can also host web gateways to provide unique access to the data and even um, host commercial uh, software. In terms of storage, um, what we promised NIH was to make 10 petabytes of high performance data storage available. And, and we have exceeded that uh, this year. And we also have additional scratch space available. And, and one thing that I should note is I've, I've been talking about the data that we make available through Bill. There is also additional storage space available on our high performance computing bridges two system. So if you need a whole lot of scratch space, um, the bridges two system uh, has that available for people to use as well. In terms of other resources that we provide, um, we do provide high speed data transfer nodes that uh, enable the fast um, connection between our system and the rest of the research world. In some cases with some investigators, we found that the networking connection, um, it's usually the local connection, um, isn't sufficient to, to transfer very large data sets. So we also can receive data on LTO seven or eight uh, tapes. Um, but before we recommend people go down the tape route, one of the unique services that we offer is we do have networking personnel on our staff who can, who can basically analyze the network between our system and the local system where the, the data is, is coming from. And uh, suggest improvements to the network. Um, and this has been very helpful uh, for many of the, the BICCN investigators. Um, in particular, there were some instances where data was being misrouted. In one case, data was being misrouted through from the Pittsburgh to Japan to the West Coast. And in another case, it was going from, from, um, from Washington the state of Washington to uh, Mexico to the PSC and straightening out some of those, those weird things that can happen with, with networking um, really can improve the throughput of, of the network and, and solve a lot of problems. We also provide extensive help desk services and uh, an extensive suite of software on our systems for people to use. If you're interested in contributing data to Bill, we do offer data contributor workshops periodically. What these workshops contain is essentially, they provide a hands-on walkthrough of the data submission process. And we welcome uh, anyone from data submitters to PIs to microscopy labs who aren't quite sure that they will have data to contribute to Bill but uh, want to find out uh, more information about, uh, about Bill. The topics covered in the workshop, um, again, this is mainly focused for data submitters, our scope, um, a hands-on introduction to the data submission process. So you, people who attend the workshop um, will complete a submission to our system. Um, as well as use some of the computational and visualization resources that, uh, that we make available. We have received some requests to host uh, a data user workshop, uh, and we are planning uh, data user workshops 
and uh, we hope to have the first data user workshop sometime early next year. I mentioned that we do provide help desk services. If you need to contact us for any reason, just send email to bill-support at psc.edu. And um, it can be a question um, whether you are a user of the bill system or not. Um, if you need a letter of support for a grant, for example, the, the best way to get that is to describe what you're, what you're doing data-wise and uh, send a brief message to bill support at psc.edu and we will get back to you and discuss the, the details that you need for uh, your proposal. Also, if you have um, any other questions, feel free to send it through our helpline. So I'm now going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the work that has been done through the Brain Initiative uh, Cell Census Network. And um, the primary project, the project that was just published in Nature, uh, is the BICCN Primary Motor Cortex uh, Mini Atlas Project. It's essentially a coordinated large scale analysis of single cell transcriptomes, chromatin accessibility, uh, DNA methylomes, spatially resolved single cell transcriptomes, um, morphological and electrophysical properties, um, as well as cellular resolution uh, input output mapping. This is all integrated together through uh, cross modal computational analysis. So it's really a, a nice uh, challenging uh, project. Um, and the project resulted in about uh, 20 different collaborative and individual lab papers published along with the flagship paper uh, in Nature. Um, and <clears throat> while the focus of, of many of the, the papers from this project were focused on, on data from, from mice, um, the consortium, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it does have a little bit of human and non-human primate uh, data sets, and those were included and described in the, the flagship paper as well. In addition to the flagship paper, there was a joint anatomy paper, and this is the paper that I'm going to um, detail a, a little bit, go into a little bit more detail on. Um, the goal of the work was, was to derive a comprehensive uh, cell type based anatomical description of the mouse uh, primary motor cortex upper limb area. Uh, the project focused on many tasks, including delineating the borders of the upper limb area, um, examining the, the laminar organization, uh, analyzing inputs and outputs, um, and projecting mapping with, with BAR-seq, as well as analyzing uh, single neuron uh, projection patterns. And this video shows the first computational pipeline step uh, in the process, which was to align the image data sets to a common reference atlas, in this case, the, the Allen uh, Common Coordinate Framework for, for mice. Um, and this was done at uh, about one micron XY resolution and shared uh, to everyone with a tool called NeuroGlancer. And the movie on the left is the raw image data. Um, the center is the common coordinate framework and the right is the overlay of the data registered onto the CCF. Uh, the second part of the video uh, shows a neuroglancer-based neuro um, data visualization of the combined uh, data uh, co-registered and overlaid onto the Allen Common Coordinate Framework. And starting over here. 
There we go. This second video shows the delineation of the anatomical borders of the primary motor cortex upper limb area of the mouse brain. The uh, VGLUT1, uh, VGLUT3, and uh, AAV retro data sets um, registered to the Allen CCF are shown with the draw borders in, in the zoomed in view. The entire primary motor cortex upper limb area is, is shown in the 3D animation views and with the 3D rotation. And this final video from this project that I'm going to show you um, shows the common coordinate framework-based analysis of ant anterior grade and retrograde tracing of the mouse primary um, motor cortex uh, upper limb area projections. The first part of the video shows registered anterior grade in red and retrograde in green labeling of the layer five neurons derived by injection of AAVs to the upper limb area for uh, the anterior grade labeling and rabies to target the, the retrograde labeling. The second part of the video uh, shows a co-registered um, CTB injection in the contralateral CP and AAV retro injection in the medulla. So those are some nice videos, and it's always interesting to, to look at, uh, at videos that are produced that show some interesting results. Uh, I'd like to summarize some of the achievements of, of the project. Um, the part of the project, um, some of the significant achievements achieved were to accurately uh, delineate the, the, the 3D border of the region. Um, there was also a little bit of refinement of the, the laminar organization that, uh, that was shown uh, through this, this process, um, particularly um, the identification of a granular L4 with uh, densely packed somas, which um, was a little bit unexpected, but uh, uh, they, the project was also able to classify um, more than two dozen projection uh, neuron types uh, in this region as well. And from the input and, and output, um, from the input and output um, work that was done, uh, we were able to put together a wiring diagram um, at, at multiple scales. Uh, in addition, through the project, there were about 300 uh, single neuron reconstructions in that region and about uh, 10,000 single neuron projections traced by molecular barcoding. So what were some of the lessons learned from, from this project? And this was a project that, that um, was really interesting because it started uh, literally whenever everyone first got, our, got funding, including Bill. Um, so people were generating this data right away. Um, people were doing it with, with different, um, different methods and uh, different ways of, of, of analyzing the data. And um, to pull everything together um, was, was quite a challenge. Um, looking back, some of the largest barriers that were faced um, were involved in, in data transfer. And in this sense, um, part of this was is that investigators were using tools locally that they had already set up and wanted to, to use for the, for the project. Um, so they really used Bill more as a data distribution site rather than a place where they computed in place. And um, they quickly realized that, that, uh, that you know, the computation and, and some of the work that they, they were doing really needed to be done. Um, done at, at Bill. 
some of the tools that uh, were used, uh, such as NeuroGlancer, were, were lacking features. Um, so there, there was some, uh, some thought that uh, these, these tools that, that, while they were useful, were mainly visualization tools. They weren't really an analysis tools and that they, they did need to um, have some additional features built into them. On the data processing front, um, one of the barriers really was that the data needed to be registered to the same CCF and version as well. Um, there are multiple um, versions of the, the Allen Reference Atlas out there, and um, we needed to make sure that the data was registered to the same CCF using the, the same uh, techniques. And uh, you know, tools just to, I, I already mentioned the tools um, lacking features. Um, one of the particular features that people found lacking in the tools was the lack of collaborative functions. Um, and there was a feeling that the, the tools, while they were, they worked well for the, the mouse project, um, some of the tools were really inadequate for, for larger uh, data and they really needed to um, be able to be uh, scaled up. And so that was some of the lessons learned from that data sharing project. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the researchers who participated in, in the project uh, and uh, I'm doing that through this slide here. Now I'd like to move on to an exciting new project and that is um, the, the Hollis project. Um, and this project is led by Dr. Elizabeth Hillman at uh, Columbia University, also involves um, Pavel Austin, who has left Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and is now at uh, Certigo Therapeutics, and Zhuahu Wu from the um, Mount Sinai Icon School of, of Medicine. And this is a really interesting um, project because this is one of the the projects that is bringing new microscope technology uh, to the forefront, um, which can produce much larger uh, data sets. And this gives us the capability to really understand some variation in, in the human brain, um, such as you know, how much variation is there between persons and do cell types principally differ between persons or is it more of a function of development uh, over time. So this project is ambitious. Um, whole brains are going to be essentially fixed and, and restrained and then run through uh, to produce MRI data. Um, once the MRI is produced, that brain will be cut into five millimeter thick slices um, go through a variety of, of staining and, and clearing processes, and then be imaged by this unique um, microscope that uh, has been developed. It's, uh, it's a light sheet based microscope. And here's an example of, of what this, this microscope can do. Instead of just doing minimal slices, it's, it basically works on these huge um, huge slices, and then it images things in, in a slightly smaller um, blocks. The slices that it can handle are six to eight millimeters thick. Um, and the machinery itself um, is, is not limited by the, the width that it can, um, it can handle. What the machinery will produce, though, are these data blocks, um, such as is shown up here. And these data blocks uh, can be up to 15 centimeters in length. So this is, this is far greater than what any of the current uh, technology uh, can produce. Here's another movie that I, I want to show you. And this is based on some preliminary data that uh, has been produced um, by the group. And this is what essentially a block is going to look like. Uh, this is only a three channel image. Um, there's going to be much more um, 
much more channels used in the final data that will be produced. And to go through that uh, fly through. And so really what the, the current plan is to, for this project is to fully leverage nuclear labeling. Um, and the preliminary work that has been done to date uh, in the human brain suggests that the nuclei are sufficiently spaced out and uniform that we can rapidly find the XYZ coordinate of every single cell that, that's been imaged. Um, once we have these locations, we can then um, look across the spectral channels and um, find a, a fingerprint for, uh, for each cell. Um, and so what's, what's shown here is basically the, the nuclei, the, the nuclei segmentation. And then um, down here, we're starting to, to throw every, all these channels together and we can use this as a cell classification or cell labeling approach. This, the, uh, the reason why we're really interested in this data as well is this is a really large uh, data set. And, and the size of the data will be in the petabyte range. Um, what hasn't been decided quite yet is the exact configuration um, that will be used for the, for the microscope, but this technology is capable of both imaging very fast um, and as well as imaging a lot of, of data, data at a, at a much uh, higher resolution. So depending on how um, equipment is, is, is selected, um, we're expecting this to be the data that we receive to be about a petabyte, but um, the technology can, can grow to 33, 31 petabytes of, of raw data, um, depending on different, uh, different choices that, that, that can be made uh, hardware-wise. So that's, that's the data, that's the Hollis project. Um, the Hollis project itself is going to um, have a number of challenges. It is a big data project. Um, we will be moving petabytes of data from um, Columbia University to, uh, to Bill. Um, the computation and analysis for these data sets will be done at Bill. And, um, we think we have a pretty good handle on this preliminary Hollis project and how to how to go about um, how how to make it work with the size of data that we are going to be receiving. But that said, I, I did want to mention that there are a number of challenges faced with sharing data of this size um, that that a lot of people um, haven't really thought through yet. And I, I just wanted to highlight what some of these would be. Um, everything from networking to data issues to the way that you access storage um, to metadata issues and how things can be uh, standardized. In my opinion, one of the most significant limiting factors uh, to um, producing very, very, very large data sets is actually moving the data. Traditionally, a lot of uh, microscopy facilities, um, including the ones at, uh, at my own university, Carnegie Mellon University, um, do not have very fast connections to the outside world. Traditionally, a lot of the data was just shared locally within the university, or it wasn't that big of a deal for the person who was subject to doing the imaging to go to the imaging center and look and analyze their, their data um, there. So what we found in, in our experience with Bill thus far is that we've run into a lot of these, these last mile issues. And the, these last mile issues are going to occur mainly at, at the university uh, level. And um, you know, there's a number of different ways that, that these can be resolved, but ultimately 
to resolve these networking issues resolves both institutional, local institutional support and, um, and money. Sometimes it's as easy as uh, reconfiguring a router um, because there's an internal uh, limitation, but other times it's a little bit more, more complicated. For example, the university may not have um, adequate connection um, out of the, the university to the, to the broader uh, internet uh, community. Um, and you really don't see these issues when you're, you're even transferring terabyte data sets, but you definitely will see these when you're moving uh, petabytes of, of data. For example, if you have a 100 gig uh, connection, um, ideally you could transfer that in a day. Now, I should have the caveat that this is ideal um, and nothing ever works I ideal. Um, on a more typical connection, uh, 10 gigabytes, um, ideally it would take you, um, let's say two weeks to, to transfer the data. And if there was a, a one gigabyte connection somewhere, um, that's really going to blow things up and it, it'll take you essentially three months to, to move the data um, with, with on this idealized uh, time of, of transfer. So uh, that is an issue that, um, that, that is faced in the community, particularly as we grow up to these petabyte uh, data sets. Another issue is how do we integrate data together? And um, where this is headed is really to using some of these newer data formats, um, such as OME czar or or HDF5, rather than the traditional um, TIFF-based uh, data. And the reason why is because both OME czar and, and HDF5 have the capability to, to store things, store the data in blocks, which makes it a lot easier to, to access that data. Um, whereas if you store things as sort of a single plane TIFF, um, you basically have to read in all the data to get the, the piece of data that, uh, that you need. Another thing that would help would be defining clear data levels. And this has been run into with, with uh, I've seen this in many projects, including the, the HubMap project. Um, in some ways, the genomics community is far ahead of the imaging community in that the um, genomics community has very well-defined data levels. They, they understand what raw data means. They understand what, what um, you know, data aligned to a reference is sort of the next data level and, and so on. Um, there really haven't been standards uh, such as that, that that apply to imaging data yet yet we do have different data levels or, or data states of imaging data we can have the raw data that comes off the microscope um, that raw data may be converted to a a different uh, file format um, so that it can be shared um, that data may then be aligned to a a reference um, such as the allen reference um, and then you know, other things can be done with that once it's aligned, um, such as, for example, then go on to do some, some neuron tracing. But to be able to rapidly share data with others, if there's an agreed upon standard as far as you know, what, what is the state of the data, that makes it the data a lot easier to, to share between projects. Also, there's the question of harmonization date of data, and is that a good thing or, or something that, that, that shouldn't be done? And in the BICCN project that I had mentioned, all the data was aligned, the time was spent to align all the data to the, common, the Allen Common Coordinate uh, Framework. Um, most people use the Allen Common Coordinate Framework, but again, there are several versions of the Allen Common Coordinate uh, framework. And there are several different ways that you can align your data with the Allen common coordinate um, framework. And so the question for the community is really, um, if it's valuable to make harmonized data available, in what shape should that look like? Um, 
a lot of times when people also register their data to the common coordinate framework, um, there's usually a downsampling that, that occurs because the, the Allen reference, um, you know, with, with some of the technologies that we have producing microscope data today, um, they're at a much higher resolution than what the, the Allen reference atlas is. So there, there is some downsampling that, that, uh, that goes on. And so the real question is, is that how, how do we harmonize data in the, the best way to, to make it available to the, to the community? Another part of this is also efficient storage for derived data. If we have a petabyte data set and the data set aligned to the Allen reference is another petabyte of data, that's two petabytes of data that we have to, have to keep around. Um, is there a way to, instead of storing the, um, the registered data, to just store the transformation so that um, one can essentially generate that higher level data on the fly without having to go through and read all the, all the pixels and, and um, store those pixels. And then there's this other issue too that I think the community has to, has to deal with. And that is throughout time as these data sets get larger, should we store everything or just the process data? Now I can tell you there's a, there's a big difference in the community. The computer scientist of the world want you to store everything because they really need that raw data to develop new algorithms and to compare their algorithms with, with different methods. From um, a biological or, or medical perspective, um, most people just use the, the process data and, and really aren't going to touch that, that raw data. So there is a balance that, uh, that, that we need to decide between storing everything versus um, storing just uh, process data. Um, also, the data storage model, um, whether we use a centralized versus a distributed model. The centralized approach is the approach that we use in Bill. But as data sets get larger, does it make more sense to have a distributed model over time? Also, how are you going to put the data on disk? Um, you, you will need a high, some sort of high performance file system. But the question really is, is that does everything need to be on that high performance file system? Can we move to a tiered system um, where the data that is used all the time is available on fast storage and the data that's rarely used is on slower storage. Hi, Alex, just so yes. you know, we've, we've got five, four minutes left. So just want to give you a heads up on that. And we can okay. always email out the answers to the questions if it's easier. Thank you. Yeah, I can, I can skip through this here. Um, and when we get to really large data sets, can we explore data seasons such as used in, in other um, large like the astronomy community for to keep um, these really large data sets available on fast storage for for a certain period of time so you make uh, and the rest of the time that data sits on on slower storage another issue i'm just going to quickly go through this um, is the provenance metadata um, and keeping track of that is another issue um, as well as software i mentioned earlier that uh, particularly collaborative uh, functions need to be added to software. Um, but there's also the issue of scaling and will we need to re-engineer workflows to take advantage of GPUs and new parallel approaches as well. There's also the issue of computation. Um, computational resources need to be co-located where the data is. And there's, depending on what the data is, there's, there's different types of resources that are appropriate um, depending on the key computational uh, use cases. So there does need to be some thought to what computation will be needed to, to access that data as well. So the good news is, is that um, people are looking into these issues. Um, if you'd like to follow up with me, um, I can be reached um, through Bill, dash support at uh, psc.edu. And finally, I would like to thank all our data contributors um, and everybody that's been involved with the, the bill project, as well as our funders, the National Institutes of Health. Thank you, Alex. 
that was, uh, you guys are doing really amazing work for a very large community. And um, with the data management sharing plan coming down, um, this is, it, it's nice to see such a uh, mature system in place uh, that takes data from pretty much anyone who needs to, who's generating that type of data. Um, I, I, there was one question that came up that I think might be most relevant. It's the most recent, uh, so I apologize. The other questions we'll send to you in an email if we don't get to them. Um, have you thought about sharing these data via a cloud instance of BIL? Yes, we have. Uh, one of the, the real issues with, with cloud is, is that once you get to, to petabyte-sized data, it makes less sense to store it on cloud financially. Um, so... I think it does make sense for some of the process data to make that available through through cloud resources, um, but the the raw data, if it's you know, if you have ten petabytes of data, it's it's much more costly to to make that available on the cloud than uh, than uh, on a local resource. And so, have you have you actually considered uh, like a hybrid? architecture with on-prem and cloud? Is that something you've thought ab through? Ab absolutely. Um, that is the approach that uh, the HubMap project has has, has taken. And um, we we kind of influenced that design. Um, and, and we expect to, to move to a, a similar design over the next few years. OK, great. Uh, so I know we have one minute. We don't have time for another question. So what I, I'll do, I wanted to thank everybody. First, Alex, thank you so much. Uh, like I said in the beginning, you're really an exemplar uh, for, uh, for building capacity for data sharing across the board. And uh, I will send around, thank you to everybody for your questions. I'll send those to Alex in an email, and I guess we, we can send them around to the listserv. Uh, with responses if you have time. And again, uh, th thanks for your presentation. We're, we're lucky to have you on the team. Susan, did you want to close anything out? I really want to thank you as well, Alex. This has been a fantastic seminar and really great progress uh, for Brain and for Bill. Uh, I'm excited to see yeah. what happens um, with the projects that you've described in the future. And again, a reminder for folks to join us on December 10th for our next data sharing and reuse seminar hosted by NH. GRI. Happy holidays. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.